And this morning, I just wanna remind you to take a minute this morning and maybe just ponder on the goodness of God over your life. Maybe there's been some disappointments. Maybe there's been some confusion. Maybe there's even been some questions. But this morning, I just want you to take a minute and remember, remember the goodness of God over your life. Remember the things that he's spoken over you, the destiny, the promises. You know, so many times we get swayed by our emotions and our feelings, but how many times did Jesus have those same emotions, those same feelings, those same questions? But I tell you, he went to the very end. He endured to the very end. And this morning, I just wanna encourage you that every one of us can endure to the very end because Jesus paid it all. He paid the highest price. His blood came with a cost. And this morning, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, I just want you to take a minute before we even start worship, before we even start praying, just take a minute and close your eyes and begin to take a moment to remember the goodness of God over your life. It could be a very small thing, it could be a very big thing, but just begin to remember and begin to thank Him. Come on, there's something that starts to change. There's something that starts to shift in the atmosphere when our lips begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. I should have died. I should have died, but you rescued me. You saw me and you rescued me, Jesus. Oh, come on. Let's take a minute and sing.
It just melts in the presence of Jesus this morning. His holiness, His beauty, we behold it this morning. God, we behold your beauty. We cannot look at you and just turn away, God. We want to stare into your face. And we will endure to the very end, God. Because you endured to the very end. You endured on that cross. And you died and you rose again in your blood. It speaks a better word this morning.
did something different, but I tell you, maybe we weren't so prepared, but the Holy Spirit was prepared to do that, and He's prepared to just flow over you this morning. I just see a river, I see a flowing river, and He's saying, how far are you going to jump in? How far are you going to go in? Are you going to go ankle deep? Are you going to go knee deep? Are you going to go all in this morning? Are you going to go all in? Because He went all in for you. He went all in for me. So I can't stand here and just and just be okay with nothing and just a little bit of worship. No, I need to pour it all out. I need to pour it all out on His feet this morning. So we're going to take just a few more minutes and we're just going to give it all to Jesus. We're not going to hold back anything. Come on. You are worthy, King of Kings. You are worthy. Lift up your voices. Lift our hands and sing hallelujah hallelujah to the Lord.
you reign Lord and we thank you that this morning you allowed us to be here this morning you gave us life and breath and strength and we thank you that we can lift our hands and lift our voice and open our heart to you and be here in your presence together we thank you Lord for the price that you paid for us to be able to do this we thank you so much for one another we bless this morning we thank you for what you're doing Lord among us we don't want to treat this just like another Sunday we open our hearts to you God that you would speak that you would speak to every person and touch every person especially those God that need need God to be awakened need God to be raised up need God to be strengthened we thank you so much Lord for your faithfulness for your love for every single person here we thank you for everything amen it is good to be here this morning and we're gonna be participating right now in communion if I can ask our team to come forward It is a privilege for us to participate in communion every time that we do it. Uh, this month we are especially blessed because we will be participating in communion today, the first Sunday of April, but also next Friday on Good Friday. So we get to do it twice this month, remembering in this month what Jesus did for us. Every time we participate in communion, it is a holy moment. And one that we approach very seriously because Paul instructs the church and says that you can actually do all of this in an unworthy way or you can do it in a worthy way. But we desire and we pray that we do this in a worthy way when we participate in communion. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. This is Paul saying this. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time, say every time, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. What I want to share shortly, and we're going to be participating, is there is power in remembering the right thing. I think, I think there are things the devil also wants us to remember. I think he wants us to remember where maybe we were praying and God did not answer us. Maybe where we were hoping for something and it didn't work out the way we wanted it to. Maybe a hard season that we went through or someone that we lost in our life. There is power in remembering, but there is power in remembering the right thing. Because this morning when we participate, Jesus says twice in, this, in these few sentences, when you eat of the bread, remember this is my body. When you drink of the wine, remember this is my blood. Today, we get to choose what we remember. I want to say this again. Today, each of us, we get to choose what we remember. We're going to pass this bread and pass this wine to one another today. And it is not my responsibility for you. It is your responsibility for yourself this morning. What do you choose to remember? Because we can remember things in our past that will hurt us. Or we can remember things in our past 
that will help us. We can remember things that will hinder our faith or we can remember things that will strengthen our faith. I want to help you remember that the reason you're standing here is because God loved you first. I want to help remember to remind you that you are here because of God's mercy, because of God's grace, because of God's unfailing love. You are here. You are here because God is good because God is faithful because even if things didn't work out the way you expected it doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be in the future I want to remind you no matter how this last week went God has promises for you in this new week I want to remind you that even if someone didn't get healed our God is still a healer I want to remind you that if things didn't work out in your life it doesn't have to be that way this week I want to remind you that if you're struggling in a certain area it does not mean God can't set you free remember remember the body of Jesus that was broken remember the blood of Jesus that was shed remember this this is our victory this morning this is our victory this morning when you partake in that bread and that wine remind yourself remind the devil remind the world visible and invisible who your God is and the price that he paid for your life today I will remember what he did for me today I will remember the price that he paid for me today I'll remember how much he loves me how good he's been in my life today I choose to remember I want you to lift your hands in prayer right now father we thank you so much for this moment that we get to participate in communion Right now, we choose. Your body today chooses. Your people today choose to remember. Remember the price that you paid. Remember where we used to be, but we are standing here yet alive. We thank you, God. How many moments, how many moments the devil wanted to take us out? How many moments we were attacked? How many moments, God, we did not know how things would turn out, but today we stand here. We stand here all because you are faithful, all because you are good. Oh, because you won, you won, you won. And we thank you so much. We thank you. We bless every member. Every member today we bless in Jesus' mighty name. And we thank you as we participate today in communion that we would do it in a worthy way. And as your body, as your people, we choose this day to remember all that you've done for us. And may you be glorified today. May you be lifted up and exalted. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, as you receive right now, team, thank you so much as we pass this out. He took his body, he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this every time that you eat of it. And he took the cup of wine and he said, drink this. This is the covenant that I've made with you, an agreement confirmed with my blood. We bless you as you participate today.
lifting it up unto him. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for the blood, Jesus. Thank you for your body that was shed. We come in remembrance this morning of what you did on the cross. We come in remembrance this morning that every single lash was for our healing. We come for in remembrance this morning that the cross that you bore on your shoulders was for our freedom. We come in remembrance this morning that your blood that was shed on the cross has broken every curse, has broken every single stronghold, has made a way, was the breakthrough for our lives. So we thank you for hope this morning. We thank you for peace this morning. We thank you for love and love everlasting. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your greatness. Come on, does anyone this morning believe Does anyone this morning? Thank him for his goodness, for his steadfast love that endures through all things. Come on. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you. We come with compassion in our hearts saying thank you for your goodness. When we didn't deserve it, you gave it. We're so grateful this morning. We're grateful for your presence. We're grateful for all that you've done in our lives. We thank you for the testimony that each and every single one of us carry, that you've set us free, that you've given us life and life abundant. Jesus, this morning, we remember of all that you've done and we thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. And we exalt your mighty name. Hallelujah. Come on, can we give God a shout of praise, a shout of glory. Hallelujah. Come on, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We, were, we will continue this atmosphere of thankfulness but can you just take a minute to say thank you to the person to your left and to your right for blessing you by being here with you this morning Hallelujah. I'm just going to share a brief, uh, just to encourage you guys, a brief word to encourage you guys on giving all your money this morning, everything, all that's in that bank account. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but hey, if the, the Holy Spirit compels you, you know, be obedient. <laughs> awesome. I, um, just even as we were talking even about the body, the body being broken of Jesus' body. You know, it's, uh, it kind of blew me away with everything that's been, you know, everything that's going on in the world. It's, uh, you know, kind of crazy. Um, obviously, something that's dear to a lot of our hearts is kind of what's going on across the world in, in Ukraine. And I remember uh, kind of thinking when all this was happening, and I just remember seeing so many people, you know, of our people, you know, other friends that I just know that were, you know, going uh, out into, you know, leaving their jobs, leaving their, um, you know, the things that they have at home and, and going out and, and uh, ministering to the people that are um, out in Ukraine to, to, to take in the refugees, you know, spread the, the gospel, give them hope, give them peace, food, and I just remember thinking, like, that's the body of Christ. Like, it blew me away that as soon as there was a need in the world, as soon as there was a need in, in, in the body of Christ, that it's like, like a mobilization, <laughs> like an army of people were like, bam, let's go. And it, and, and it blows me away that, you know, we can all, you know, partner 
in, in you, know, um, you know, some people give by, let's say, going, but also there's the aspect of partnering in the, in, in giving, in giving our seed, you know, giving our, uh, our money as we work here, you know, we, we, we partner and we give, um, but it, it blows me away that the way that God has created his church, as it says in uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe chapter 12, I'm going to share this, it says, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that Lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually are members of it. What a privilege and honor it is that as soon as that there is a lack or a need, that the way God has designed the church was as soon as there's something, there's a hurt here that the rest of the body comes in and helps to lift up. It blew me away that the Holy Spirit is, is, is like so involved in, 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 in the middle, in, in the midst of the church that as soon as there's, there's a lack in one area that the Holy Spirit goes and says, look, there's a lack, go. You are released to go and, and help. And that's the beauty of the church is that when there is a lack, the rest of the body comes and lifts up. It's just the beauty of how we get to partner with the Lord and to help our brothers and sisters in Christ from all around the world. Whether we saw so many testimonies of people receiving, um, receiving you know, refugees into their homes into America or, or, or so many testimonies of, oh man, we've received so much um, funds that we can do this to help out in, in Ukraine or, or, or hey, we're releasing people all, from all around the world to come into these areas to help and to bless the people that are in need. I'm so encouraged because I know that even just with around, you know, in, in, in my life that there's so many, um, that the body in my life has so many times, you know, helped me, uh, was there for me and I just know that the Holy Spirit the God, the way that he created our bodies, that we are there for one another. And we are there uh, spiritually, practically, through the act of giving. But it all goes hand in hand to build the church, to, to see people get encountered by God, to see the uh, lost souls uh, uh, come to Christ, to see the body of Christ that could be uh, hungry, hurting in one area, to have the body come together and cover and be there. As, as it says that we are there for one another, that, that if one member suffers, that, you know, we are there. So what an honor and what a privilege it is for us as the body to come, to prepare, to, to sow a seed that we know will spread to, um, to where it needs to go, to bring fruit to the kingdom of God, to bring uh, the seed that we sow, that it will bring a major harvest and a fruit. Amen? What a pri privilege it is that we get to come together as the body and, and uh, be the hands and feet to Christ through our finances, through our, through our time, through our servanthood. It truly is a beautiful thing that how the Lord has designed the church to be, the hands and feet of Jesus everywhere they go. So can we just take a minute, can we just bow our heads? And can we just thank God for the seed that's going to be sown? Ushers, if you could just make your way forward to pass the buckets. Lord, we just thank you for each and every single person, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God. Lord, you are in control, Lord God. So we just thank you, Lord God, that in this time, Lord God, in this season, Lord God, whether it's, it's, it's what's happening across the world or whether it's in our own lives, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, that you are faithful, you are good, and we thank you that, that you have given us your body, Lord God, that where there's a struggle in one area, Lord God, that, that the body comes together to lift up, Lord God. So we just thank you for your seed, Lord God. We thank you that your seed, Lord, that is given this morning, Lord God, will go out to the world, Lord God, will go out, Lord God, to those, Lord God, that are in need and that you're the seed that we give this morning, Lord, will be a benefit to the body and to this world, Lord God, to, to, that this seed will give a great harvest, Lord God, that those, Lord God, will encounter you, Jesus, that they will see you, that they will uh, encounter your goodness, they will encounter your faithfulness, they will, will encounter, 
Lord God, your, 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 your love, Lord God, your kindness, Lord God. So we just thank you, Lord, for the seed that was, th- uh, that was sown this morning, Lord God. And we just thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing in this place. And we just pray that you multiply it, that you lead and you direct it to go where it needs to go. Lord, we love you, we bless you, and we give you glory and honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah, church. We do have a video, so just please fix your eyes towards the screen as they play the video. God is good, amen. I want to start with just saying a huge thank you for anyone who volunteered. We had almost 250 volunteers to make Journey to the Cross happen. Come on, was that not incredible? Over 1,200 people came. And that's not including children under the age of seven. Each scene acted out their skit at least 34 times. That's not including uh, the practices that they did. Many, many first-time volunteers, we just want to say a huge thank you. We had difficulties. We had fun times. On the first night, it was raining. Literally, the whole scene outside just did the Garden of Gethsemane under the rain, like true Northwesterns. We had a kid catch Jesus sipping Red Bull at the Last Supper. We had chickens run loose. We had a donkey that pooped all over the sanctuary. This took five days to set up and just two hours to tear down. If you were here at 9 p.m., it looked like, it looked. You walk in the morning and it looks like a clean, beautiful church. And I just want to extend a huge, huge thank you to absolutely everyone. So many hours, so many people volunteered. Thank you. And you know, I also want to thank everybody that invited people. Because it was so awesome to hear somebody say, oh, that's my coworker. Oh, hey, my neighbors came. Oh, hey, the people down the street came. Thank you so much. That was the whole goal. And absolutely everybody that walked through Journey to the Cross had an opportunity to pray the prayer of repentance in the final scene uh, on the day of Pentecost. It was absolutely incredible. God is doing something. I love what David said that, you know, the church does not disappear when the times get tougher. But it rises up. It's our time to rise up. There's so much more at hand. Amen. Also, can we greet our wonderful friends from Medford. Thank you so much for joining us. Such a privilege. We have an incredible uh, church in Medford and they are, have become dear friends to us and they're here with us today. 
I want to make a few announcements. Next Sunday, April 10th, is Palm Sunday. George invited you to Good Friday this coming up Friday, but it's the one afterwards. But you can still show up. Church is going to be open. So April 10th, Palm Sunday. April 15th at 7 p.m. on a Friday, we're going to be here for Good Friday. We're going to have a wonderful communion service together. We're going to celebrate together what Jesus did for us. And then April 17th is Resurrection Sunday. Be ready for that. Once again, invite. Invite people. There, God is knocking on people's hearts. Amen. Amen. If you guys didn't notice, construction has started and is going full swing. We are one of the few churches that can do construction and Journey to the Cross and youth conferences all in the same time. We don't invite OSHA here. Um, we just know the acronym. But it's in full swing. It's going awesome. Um, not only was the veil torn last night, we even put up a plexiglass window so you can look past the curtain that nobody could look before. So as you walk out of church, there's going to be a plexiglass window and you can look inside and see what's happening. The framing has started and it's not going to slow down. We're going to frame up right up until conference. We're going to pause for just a weekend, do our youth conference and then continue. So we ask everyone to pray. We ask everyone to partner with us. We ask everyone to continue to, to donate if you can. And we're excited for what God's doing. Amen. There's so much happening. And, and this is a time when many are saying, hey, 2020, 21, 22 are tough times. But it's so exciting to be in a place where not only do we not slow down, we speed up. And we say, Lord, we know you're coming back and there are things that need to be done at hand. And you're watching videos of construction. Right after this video, we want to show a video of Ukraine and what we're doing there. Um, already this church has donated so many funds. And we were able to reach out and uh, pass on funds to people that are there. That are there right in the midst of the warm churches that are there. Pastors that are there. Uh, one of these pastors was able to purchase a van because their van broke down. And now they're using that van uh, to share the gospel, to feed people. So can we turn on that video? And I'll interpret. March 31st. This is city of Krasnogorsk. We can hear the, the bombs. We can hear the uh, sound of thunder. But we are sharing the food for people. We're preaching the gospel. Church of Truth, I thank you so much for this huge help that you, you allow us to continue to do where God sent us to go. And you bought us this van for us. And we're using this van we're to, to serve people, to bring food to them. Yesterday, we evacuated 170 people with this van. God's allowing us to share the gospel. Thank you so much. Without you, we would not be able to do what we're able to do. Thank you so much for your sacrificial hearts. Thank you, church. Thank you. And that... That video just shows one of, one of very many things that's being done. So thank you. Continue to pray. Continue to donate. God is on the move and he's moving through his church. Amen. And another sign of the last times is that people are getting married. So we want to announce yet another couple that fell in love, that just had their engagement party last night. And they are uh, on their way to marriage. So can we please greet Katie Libidenka? And the young man that fell in love with Katie, Marcus Dickinson. Marcus, haven't seen you this happy in a long, long time, man. This is good. Come on, church. We believe in family, amen? We believe in strong marriages. We believe in what God does in families. And we're so happy for you guys that you're making this decision and you're making it on Christ. And so we also want to greet the parents, Katie's parents, Sergey and Galina, would you please rise? We want to honor you. And also Marcus's parents, Matt and Irina, please. Thank you so much for raising your children in the word of God. And what you've invested in them will now grow in the family that they are creating. Church, can you rise up? Can we stretch out our hands? And we want to bless this young couple. Because we understand that the devil is against marriage. That the devil wants to destroy it. But we know... 
that Jesus Christ is victorious. And he who builds his life on that rock, the storms may come, but that house will not fall. God, we thank you and we bless Marcus and Katie. We thank you, Lord, on their, on their path towards marriage, Lord God. We pray that you would provide for them, that you would strengthen them, that you would grow them even right now in this season, God. That they would learn to trust you even more, Lord. And the decision that they're making, let it be founded on the word of God, Lord. We bless them and we thank you for all that you've set out in front of them, Lord God. Let this family that will be born bring you glory, bring you honor. We give you all glory, Jesus. You are who you say you are in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And now can we greet Alex Maximov. All right. Well, good morning, church. Um, my name is Alex. I'm going to be sharing this morning. Um, and... Uh, we're going to be talking about a particularly interesting conversation. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. A particularly interesting conversation that Jesus had with a certain man. Um, and this man happens to be a very successful, respected, a theological person who is pretty much one of the rulers in Israel. Uh, and his relationship to Jesus is, well, it's a little bit tricky. Um, but before we dive into the text for this morning, uh, we need some context. So I want to share a story that people in Jesus' time would have known very well. Um, but it's not so common for us today. So let's, let's have a look. I brought an oil painting or a picture of an oil painting. Um, this is actually, the original one is in Madrid, Spain. It's from the 1600s. It's been a little bit redone, I think, on this painting. But uh, this is called The Brazen Serpent. And it's actually portraying a very dramatic scene from Numbers chapter 21. Now, what happened in Numbers chapter 21 was God had made a specific agreement with the people of Israel who were actually in very, very bad slavery and bondage in Egypt for a long time. They were very mistreated, and they were crying out to God, and God decided to rescue them. So he rescued them, provided for them a way out through absolutely impossible odds, did things that nobody could even imagine. He showed judgment on the people that were refusing to let them go. He displayed his grace, goodness, and power and holiness to them over and over and over again. But the thing is, our people had a little bit of a problem, and it was a grumbling problem. And it kept going and going and going. Besides, besides God's multiple interventions, um, they kept grumbling. They began to speak against God, against Moses, who God put in charge to take them out of there. And despite repeated warnings, they kept continuing. And God actually executes judgment on these people and sends venomous snakes into their midst. And when the snakes would bite people, the people would actually die. And so the people realize, uh-oh, something's going on here. Um, and so they came to Moses. And I'm picking up from Numbers 21, verse 7. Um, the people came to Moses and said, we, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Now that this story is in our minds, we've seen the picture. Um, most Jews would know this very well. But there's something else, before we get to this conversation that this man has with Jesus, there's something else that we need to know about him. See, he's actually a Pharisee. When we think of the word Pharisee, oftentimes today we're thinking of hypocritical, judgmental, just evil people. And I'm, I'm sure they've earned a lot of that. Um, but what did people think of Pharisees back then? Or, or more importantly, what did they think of themselves? See, a Pharisee was someone who was zealous for God. Uh, they were basically masters of the text, theological bosses. Like, th these guys were obeying every obscure command you can think of, and they added some more just in case. Uh, they were at the very top of Jewish society. I mean, these guys were authoritative. They saw themselves as the gatekeepers to the incoming kingdom of God. And really, they kind of saw the kingdom as being kind of under their own control. They were basically allowing or not allowing people, and they were creating all sorts of laws and rules that everyone needs to obey. Jesus is actually about to shatter this entire view in this conversation. But the person we're talking about isn't just a Pharisee. He's actually a member of the ruling council of Israel, uh, also known as the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a, a group of people, Pharisees, Sadducees, all sorts of priests and teachers that made up a big group of people that made all of the legal decisions for Israel. Think Supreme Court in, in the day. 
the Romans, when they had control over a region, they typically didn't like to get too involved in the local politics of the day. As long as you guys don't cause us trouble, we continue to get your taxation, we're good. Just figure out your own stuff yourself. Sometimes they would come in and get things back in order, but ultimately the Sanhedrin's job was to keep the Romans at bay and to basically restore order in the place. And this person that we're about to read about is actually a Pharisee and a member of the Jewish ruling council. So not only is he a teacher of the law of God, but he's actually the, one of the people that makes the laws for the people of the land. Very big deal. Now let's get to the conversation. Um, it's going to be taking place in John, the Gospel of John. And John has this, like, it's, it's a literary work of art. Like, the way that it's made, the thematic elements, he plays with all sorts of things in the Gospel. And it's almost like God was involved. It's awesome. But he, he basically has this theme. And I think this theme can be summarized with believing in Jesus for eternal life. It's, it starts with something like that, and it ends with him literally saying why he wrote the Gospel. But the person of interest, well... His name is Nicodemus. If you guys, some of you may have already figured that out. I'm starting at uh, John chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. There is that thing. We, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, a few things. I'm going to stop right here. Uh, a few things. He came to Jesus at night. Now, besides the potential play in John's gospel between themes of darkness and light, I think there's something more going on here. I think that he may have came to Jesus at night because he was a little bit concerned about what people would think. This is a member of the Jewish ruling council. So I, sh I don't think he wants to be seen associating with the teacher who's stirring up trouble and causing conversations to happen behind his closed doors. But he also comes to him with questions, right? He's like, hey, I I've seen the signs that you've performed. We know that you have to be from God. That's the only explanation. So he even acknowledges that. Now this is Jesus' reply in verse 3. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you, should, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Let's pause here for a moment. Nicodemus is not a dumb guy. A lot of times he gets a really bad rap for asking these questions, but he's very intellectual, very knowledgeable. He knows the law like the back of his hand. You don't just become a Sanhedrin member by not being someone who's intelligent. There's so much going on here that we simply don't have the time to unpack, but born of water in the spirit tends to have its own ongoing debate of what all that means a little bit. Um, but I'm not really going to dive into that because it's not part of the, the point today. I do want to reference the prophet Ezekiel because Nicodemus and Jesus would have both known about this very well. And here's what he says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 and 20, through 27. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will get this sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. My point is this. If you want to open your eyes to the kingdom of God and participate in it, you must be born again. You must be given that new heart. Put that spirit within you. The world seems to think that Jesus came to make people nice to each other. Really, he came to give us new life. And a supernatural encounter with God the Holy Spirit is a prerequisite requirement if you're going to see the kingdom of God. Everything Nicodemus thinks he has isn't enough. Accomplishments don't cut it anymore. And Nicodemus, well, he needed something more. So whether or not his response was one of offense or sarcasm or genuine confusion, I'm not entirely sure. But what's becoming increasingly clear is that what Nicodemus was doing, his role, his birth, all of that wasn't enough. But here's the problem. He's the best at it. And so first of all, he's, he's a Jew. He already sees himself as God's chosen people. He's in. But on top of that, he's a teacher of the law. He's a Pharisee. So nobody really knows the law better than this guy. 
But on top of that, he's a ruler, basically, a local ruler who, who guides the nation on how to live righteously as a nation. If you want to talk about righteousness that you've earned, this guy would be the epitome of that. But it's not enough. See, Nicodemus is, or Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you need to be born again. That's, that's telling him that everything you've accomplished and everything you've done is not enough. You need a new life. And where is Jesus going here then? I mean, how does this spiritual rebirth even happen? Glad you asked. Uh, verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, remember the painting, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him ha may, uh, believes may have eternal life in him. Now, Jesus is referencing the story of the painting that we saw earlier. Remember that from Numbers? Just like the people in the wilderness who were dying needed to look up to God's way out in order to live, Nicodemus and others like him will need to look up to the lifted up Savior to have life in him. You know, actually, I just realized this morning while we were doing communion that this kind of is on, on par with that. I, I, just this morning, I didn't prepare this for communion. But um, Nicodemus and others like him still need to look up. Nicodemus needs to look up rather than looking at his own righteousness, his life, his accomplishments. And then the famous passage in John 3.16 comes right after this. God so loved that he gave that anyone who believes in him should have eternal life. There's that theme again. Nicodemus appears a second time in the story, though. So this isn't over. And this time, he's demonstrating a pivotal point in his character development. Let's, let's look at this. In John chapter 7, I'm going to start with verse 45, but what had happened was that the Pharisees, they sent guards to arrest Jesus. Yes, they have that kind of power. And, and, and we pick up from verse 45. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? So... We sent you out to get Jesus. He just came back. Where is he? Um, and so uh, no one sp ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number. So Nicodemus is sitting among them, right? asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it. You'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Maybe they should have asked him themselves where he was born, but I digress. Nicodemus is the person that so desperately wants to know, but he's letting his reputation, his esteem, his prestige, his education, the fear of man get in the way. It looks here like he's trying to defend Jesus from the injustice of, of a fake trial, basically, and, and let him speak for himself, but he kind of just gets brushed off. You know, last time, though, he talked to Jesus, it was in secret. But now he's actually trying to defend him among his own peers, although still very, very carefully. But Nicodemus appears one last time in the story. And this time, it's an entirely different scene. Things look very different. And this is the last time he appears. He's accompanying a name, man named Joseph, uh, who actually is a secret follower of Jesus, and we find out from a different gospel that he's part of the same Sanhedrin. So he's on that same team. Um, and this is in John chapter 19, verses 38 and up. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus, which isn't always an easy thing to do, especially when someone just got crucified as, as basically as a threat to the Roman Empire and you come to ask for the body. Okay, we'll continue. Um, now, I'm just saying. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. So there's Nicodemus again. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and alloy, about 75 pounds, that's enough. Uh, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and stripes of linen, and strips of linen. Uh, this was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Nicodemus. Check this out. He went from coming to Jesus at night in fear of those who would, what, what would think about him to carrying his body openly for all to see. 
I mean, he brought a lot of spices. Five or six pounds is plenty. This guy brought a lot. But the point is, there was no more hiding. See, the thing is, the fear of losing his reputation, his esteem, um, didn't really make him, his decisions for him anymore. Uh, maybe for the first time in his life, he learned what it means to look up. And so what can we actually learn from Nicodemus? Well, he was curious, but it seems wasn't ready to completely give up what people thought of him and his old beliefs and, beliefs and view of reality and the world around him. Maybe you're here today and you're just a little curious, and we're so happy you're here. Uh, take the time that you need. Probe, ask questions. Nicodemus had genuine questions that he came to Jesus with, and, and, and Jesus took the time to explain, and maybe he, he knew that Nicodemus would understand later, and maybe he did. But I wonder what was going, uh, what, was, what the turning point was for, for Nicodemus, right? I mean, was, like, was he present during the crucifixion? What was going through his mind? Was he angry, maybe at his fellow Sanhedrin members, at himself? Uh, was he upset? Maybe he was confused, right? Like, this is a real person. Maybe he still had tons of questions left, wasn't sure what was going on. Maybe he felt guilty because he's like, man, I should have done more. We're not entirely sure. And I wonder when they were taking his body off the cross if Nicodemus had Jesus' blood on his hands. Because that very blood would have been the one that's now giving him new life if only he'd looked up. He no longer cared about what people would think, about the position, public reputation, or apparently even his money. Uh, it was all about Jesus. And I'm sure he still had many unanswered questions, fears, doubts, struggles, but he'd made a decision. And, and this time, it, maybe it just changed his whole life. So did he end up looking up after all and not trusting him himself? The author isn't entirely clear on this. And we don't entirely know what Nic where Nicodemus' heart was. We can make assumptions, but we can't be entirely sure exactly what happened to him. But maybe that makes it easier for some of us to identify with him. I know I do. You know, we all get curious, maybe have questions for Jesus. We want to know some things. My prayer this morning is that we continually put our trust in Jesus for eternal life, for the new birth he's given us, if indeed you have been born again. May we not be content with just knowing about him, but actually knowing him. Not just believing that he can save us, but actually that it's because of him that we continue to be saved from day to day. And may you rest in the security that he'll never leave or forsake you. And this is a reminder to someone today that you've been given new life and the righteousness that you carry is found in Christ and not in your deeds and actions. And if you fall and make the decision today to get up, run into his arms because he's waiting for you. Look up. So when you think of your position before God or, you know, how you stand before him, what actually comes to mind? Like, what's the first thing? You're like, how, how is my relationship with God? How does he see me? What is my position? Um, is it how little you've sinned this week? Or is it maybe you're a good husband or wife or, or parent? How dedicated you are. Maybe it's your ministry. Man, you do a lot for the Lord. Um, maybe it's the time that you actually spend in the quiet place, in the presence with God. Maybe you know your Bible really well. Or during worship, you really connect with God and you've been doing a lot of that lately. What comes to mind? Is it any of those things? Which are all good things, right? Or do you look up at him, casting your accomplishments aside? If not, it's, it's a dangerous place to be. I guarantee you, if you find your righteousness and right standing before God in yourself, it's a train headed to destruction. You'll never be able to live up to your own standards, much less God's. You'll never be able to drag that addiction into the light, kicking and screaming and asking your brothers and sisters to beat it to death. You'll never be able to ask for help. Why? Well, because, I mean, you'll lose, you'd lose your perceived righteousness when it should have been in Christ all along. Aren't you glad God made a way out? All you gotta do is look up. I love this. Is there a place in your life, if you're honest, where you're trusting in your own righteousness? Be honest with yourself. Maybe the invitation today for you is to get your eyes off of you and look up. How do we approach God after we've fallen short? After we feel inadequate, less than, undeserving? Do, do I look to Jesus or, or do I fight those fiery serpents on my own? Do I wait until I'm better at being holy or do I continue to pursue the holiness of God and be transformed by it? I'm going to finish up. If we could all stand. You see, Nicodemus, he saw Jesus face to face. You can say he, he, he spoke with the miracle worker. He, he saw the miracles. He saw the influence. He saw the crowds. He saw the teaching he saw everything Jesus did. He watched him from the sideline, right? 
You can say he was at the healing crusades and got to interview the healer personally in the green room afterwards or something like that. Yet he still lingered on the sidelines for a while. Knowing about Jesus is not enough. Knowing that God exists is not enough. Knowing that Jesus died on the cross is not enough. You have to put your trust in him for your salvation. The bronze serpent in the wilderness was there, but the people still needed to believe that it was there and that it could save them and look at it. And so today, are you looking to Jesus for your salvation and your rebirth, or are you looking at yourself and trying to find that within yourself? And if you're struggling, you, you, can't find, you can't fight those fiery serpents on your own. So this applies to both. If, if you're looking at your own righteousness or if you're struggling, you both, both, both of those options we have to look up. We can't find the, fight those fiery serpents on our own through sheer willpower. And if that's something you've been doing, how's that been working out for you? You know, I have my own history with all sorts of things and, and I wish I would have learned this much before the time that I actually did. But how many more ministers need to fall before, before we realize this? You can't stand the pressure of carrying your own righteousness. You just can't. You must look up. There's no more standing on the sidelines. You have to put your trust in Jesus and let that shape everything around you. Rather than observing from a distance and seeing what God does, you have to jump in at some point. We don't know for sure if Nicodemus did that. I can't say. But the author mentions Joseph as a believer, but not Nicodemus. I sure hope so. Otherwise, Nicodemus just spent, his, basically spent time around Jesus during his entire ministry and, and never got to leave the comfort and safety of his own position to get in the presence and life-giving new birth that Jesus had on offer. Maybe he never did look up. I personally think maybe he did and at great risk to everything he holds dear. But if we want Jesus, it doesn't happen from a safe distance as a spectator. You must eventually take the step of faith and put your trust in him. Put it all on the line, all or nothing. Knowing about him isn't enough. What are you trusting in really, if you're honest with yourself? And maybe you're, you're, you're in a group that's noticing that you've been trusting in your own righteousness and you've been pretty good. And that's how, what you rely on when you think of your relationship with God. But what makes you feel safe and secure? Is that it? What are you relying on today if, if you feel like you're good enough to be in the presence of God or good enough person for God or, or saved? Whatever that is, you're going to have to let it go. You're going to have to let it go. You have to look up. It's the only way. Look up to the lifted up king. Look at his scars. Look at the nails in his hands and his feet. Look at the blood that's poured out for you. And remember that we love because he first loved us. All of that was love, and it was all worth it for him. And remind, remind yourself that you were born again. Look up. So maybe let's reflect and ask ourselves today, what is my mindset? Am I looking up to be saved? Or am I, am I fire, fighting these fiery serpents all by myself? Friend, if that's somewhere where you are, please don't leave here today without getting prayer, without meeting with somebody, without pursuing and seeking this new birth for yourself. It changes everything about you. It changes your identity. It changes how you stand with God and it keeps you there. There's no greater security than knowing that you've been born again and that you've been bought with a price that no one else can compete with. And so throw your salvation completely on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. Jesus said you must surpass the, uh, the righteousness of the Pharisees. Try to surpass the righteousness of Nicodemus. None of us can and even Nicodemus failed. And so... Maybe today is a reminder, if you are born again, that there's actually no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, guilt is when you do something wrong. Condemnation is when there's something wrong with you. And when, when, and when you're in Christ Jesus, there's no longer condemnation for you. But if you haven't, if you haven't placed your faith in Christ, if you haven't looked up, maybe the invitation for you today is to look up for the very first time. And maybe you need to recognize you can't do this on your own, like all of us did and acknowledge God's way out. That Jesus dying on the cross in your place is what gives you that new birth and looking up to him to find your righteousness rather than inwardly in yourself. He died to make you reconciled with God, made right with him, give you new life, new vision, new purpose, a new heart, a right spirit, renewal, look up. 
So let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the provision that you gave us. We're so thankful for your son on the cross that died so that we can have eternal life in him. Holy Spirit, I pray that you come and you touch every heart. Would you begin to open up our own assumptions, our own, our own thoughts about our righteousness. And if someone's struggling, God, may you lift their eyes up to the author and perfecter of our faith, God. God. Would you lift our eyes up and cause us to look up rather than within ourselves? Whether it's accomplishments or failures, God, it doesn't matter, we need to look up to you. And this morning, God, would we be realigned with you? Would we be honest with ourselves, God? And I pray for every person in this place that you would draw us near to you, that you would show us your love, show us your goodness. Thank you for your mercy, God. Spirit of God, would you move? Would you, would you reveal? Would you draw near, God? And would your love for us be evident in our hearts? Would you draw people to, to yourself? Would you draw us to repentance? Would you cause us to be honest with ourselves and in turn be honest with you? We thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. As we worship, I just want to invite anybody who needs prayer right now, who needs to look up. If you're here in this place and you just sensed, as Alex was speaking, sense the Holy Spirit drawing your heart, saying, look up, look up, let me give you my righteousness. If you're in this place, don't stand where you are standing. Forget about your self-image, forget about what people may think. It's you and Christ and He's asking you, look up. Let me give you what only I can give you. If you're in this place, you can come out. We'll pray with you. There is absolutely no shame in coming to Christ, but there's victory on the other side of that meeting with Him. There's victory, there is life, there is freedom. If you're in this place and you're in need of prayer, come on out. The altar is open. We want to pray with you. It doesn't matter if you've never met Christ or if you've been a Christian all your life, but you sense that there's just a need for you to look up again. You sense that there's a need where Christ is knocking on your heart saying, look up. See the righteousness that I provided to you on that cross. This is your moment. This is your time. I also want to extend an invitation for anybody that's just in need of prayer. Maybe you're in need of prayer for healing. Maybe for your family. Maybe for fears in your life. Come on out. We want to pray with you. We want to take this time as we worship, as we lift up the name of Christ. He is here right now. God, we thank you. We worship you, Jesus.